Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Dear students, today we are going to discuss the drugs used in asthma. In this lecture, we will be discussing um, a general pathophysiology of the asthma, major types of drug used in asthma treatment, recognize the types of drugs used in the asthma management and their mechanisms, therapeutic uses, route of administration, and it uh, and adverse effects of each agent. So starting from the definition of asthma, asthma is a chronic uh, inflammatory disorder of the airways. So basically it is an inf uh, inflammatory disorder uh, which is characterized by a reversible airways narrowing and airways hypersensitivity which can be severe and sometimes it can be fatal. So uh, uh, it is one of the most common chronic diseases worldwide which is considered as a serious public health problem affecting peoples of all ages throughout the world. So what happens here that uh, basically it's a chronic in, uh, inflammatory disorder and due to which it causes the airways narrowing and difficulty leading to difficulty in breathing. So that's why we will be discussing the options for this, that we need anti-inflammatory drugs for chronic management of uh, this disease. And then we can use the drug which causes the, uh, the dilation of the bronchioles in order to ease down the breathing. So asthma involves difficulty in breathing due to inflammation because inflammation can cause swelling and that leads to difficulty in breathing. Uh, along with that, uh, mucus is produced within the airways, which further causes difficult to breathe and tightening of the muscle around the airways, uh, leading to further narrowing down of the airways, making it difficult to, to breathe. The onset of, uh, onset of the symptoms can occur at any age. However, we'll discuss that it's more common in the females, especially in the adult age, uh, because of their um, hormones uh, and less common in, in males. So there are different factors that can be attributed to the onset of uh, the prevalence and onset of uh, asthma. We will discuss it in the next slides. So you can see here, this is the normal bronchiole, well, this is the uh, asthmatic bronchiole, which is inflamed, narrowed down with mucus, so that make it difficult to breathe properly. The causes of uh, asthma, while the exact cause of asthma is not known, it is thought to have a variety of factors interacting with one another early in life result in the development of asthma. So the exact cause is still not known, but there are factors that can contribute to the development of these asthma. We will be discussing it in the next slide. So that the causes could be parents with asthma, so it has a genetic association. Uh, allergy, that's one of the atopy or allergy to something because allergy can trigger down this asthmatic attack that can cause the contraction of the, uh, the bronchioles. Childhood respiratory infections, exposure to allergens or infections while in the immune system is developing. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, especially aspirin case, um, cause asthma in sensitive uh, people so it could be drug induced because you might disc, uh, recall the in the mechanism of action of inside especially f spring and it decreases the uh, cyclox it inhibits the cyclooxygenase pathway so the shift wind more toward the lipoxygenase pathway and that causes more production of leukotrienes uh, and that inflammatory uh, mediators which causes the uh, construction of the uh, of the bronchioles. Okay, so that's what we will be discussing in details. Uh, clinical presentations include coughing, wheezing, a whistling sound, shortness of breath, chest tightness, sneezing, and runny nose, itchy and inflamed eyes. These are the general clinical presentation of the asthma. 
uh, work related asthma is also same like the general asthma but it's a pre-existing asthma that is triggered or made worse by the exposure to one or more substance in the work related environment so it is basically related to the work related, related environment if the if patient is exposed to an allergen in the work area where he's working then then it's known as a work related asthma so the side and symptoms is almost the same uh, as the general asthma asthma is caused by the exposure to a substance in the work environment can cosma be cured um, no especially we can manage it uh, but uh, like hypertension or uh, diabetes it's all for chronic disease and we can manage it through um, and or control it through um, lifestyle modification or uh, medication depends on the severity of the uh, patient symptoms so by lifestyle like we can avoid the trigger or reduce exposure to the triggers or allergens which causes the asthmatic onset or using medication to control the symptoms so what kind of medication we can use um, basically we uh, there are two options long-term management and short-term management in asthmatic severe asthmatic um, attack we can use uh, these uh, rapid acting bronchodilators in the form of inhaler you might have seen these uh, asthmatic patients they carry this inhaler along with them uh, which are rapid acting uh, rapid and short acting bronchodilators so during asthmatic attack they directly relax the muscles around the airways and causing the bronchodilations and improve the breathing while well, for long-term management we can use controllers so they they are long term they have long half life and they can be used for uh, they can be used to prevent the excess production of mucus and reduce the inflammation of the airway so basically we have discussed this is the main cause is the inflammation so we can use anti-inflammatory drugs or uh, we can use drugs which can decrease the hypersensitivity or immune response to allergen so we can use that drug for the long-term management for risk cure or quick relief we can use these uh, rapid acting bronchodilators and you know we have we will discuss that again that uh, beta 2 agonist sympathetic agonist can cause brain uh, bronchodilation and parasympathetic antagonist can also cause the bronchodilation so we will discuss that in details in the coming lectures in the coming slides the risk factor can be uh, from the host or from the environment like from the patient itself it has a genetic association so one of the risk factor is the genetic makeup of the patient obesity also play uh, a role in the in the asthma because it can because the uh, excessive uh, due to the excess weight around the chest and uh, the abdomen make it harder to breathe so it's also one of the things uh, if fats also produces infl uh, inflammatory substances so that can further aggravate the symptoms of asthma gender um, it's also play an important role in the risk of asthma uh, normally uh, uh, it's more common in in the boys especially before adult uh, age it's more common in the boys but after adulthood it's more common in the female so it's been said that there is a relation with the uh, with the sex hormones so basically um, females are somewhat more prone to in the adult age while uh, males are protected because of their uh, sex hormones in the adult age so it's more common in the females in the adult age and less common in uh, males uh, during the adult period uh, environmental factors allergens um, yes yeah, uh, that can trigger the vasoconstriction so it could be indoor or outdoor allergens a viral respiratory infection inhaled irritants such as some people are allergic to tobacco 
uh, smoke, air pollution, strong odor, they can also uh, trigger the um, trigger the asthmatic attack. Cold ear exercise or strong emotions. Uh, this could be cold ear can also cause the vasoconstriction or bronchoconstriction or exercise during exercise you need more uh, breathing so that can worsen the, the symptoms of asthma diet or drugs such as aspirin some drugs can also cause the construction of the bronchial so that would lead to uh, aggravate the symptoms of asthma so the goal of therapy is to uh, minimize the chronic symptoms ideally no but that's not sometimes it's too minimal to minimize the chronic symptoms to minimize the exacerbation or asthmatic attacks um, so that will reduce the emergency visits a minimal or ideally no need for as needed use of beta 2 agonists so if we have minimized the chronic symptom and exacerbation, it can decrease the need for the um, rescuer drugs like uh, beta 2 agonist, which are used during asthmatic attacks in order to cause the bronchodilation. Uh, no limitation on activity, including exercise, so it's an ideal goal for this uh, therapy. Minimal or no adverse effects from medicine, so it might have, but we have to minimize it now the choice of treatment is guided by the severity of the patient's asthma whether at what stage stage one stage two or stage three a patient current treatment uh, pharmacological properties and availability of various forms of asthmatic treatment and economic consideration of the patient whether he can afford the therapy or not so that uh, these 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 uh, factors has to be taken care during the uh, treatment so these are the drugs which can uh, be used for the management of asthma uh, bronchodilators what happens we have discussed what happens during asthma is the uh, the, the narrowing down of the bronchioles which make it difficult to breathe so bronchodilators we will discuss different types of bronchodilators anti-inflammatory it's an and it, it's an inflammatory uh, disease right chronic inflammation can lead to this narrowing down of this uh, bronchial so we can use anti-inflammatory agents in order to reduce that inflammation which causes the uh, con the narrowing down of these uh, bronchioles and we can use uh, leukotrienes antagonist and IgE antibodies which can decrease the hypersensitivity reactions to allergy so we can use this drug for the um, as a prophylaxis to reduce the uh, asthmatic attack and this can be used uh, both in the, the acute and chronic phases or the for the um, this can be used both for the acute management or for the chronic management of the asthma uh, similarly like we have a short acting bronchodilators and long acting bronchodilators so short acting can be used for rapid management in the uh, asthmatic attack while long term can be used for the um, chronic management or long term treatment of uh, asthma. So what kind of bronchodilators we can use? Remember um, the autonomic pharmacology again, um, sympathetic agonist during sympathetic agonist remember the receptors that are present on the bronchioles are beta 2 receptor so we need beta 2 agonist which will cause a bronchodilation what happens in parasympathetic system to the uh, bronchioles so in parasympathetic agonist calls um, cause cause vasoconstriction so we need parasympathetic antagonist muscarinic antagonist will inhibit the vasoconstrictions and that will lead to bronchodilation similarly we will have this theophylline or phosphodiesterase inhibitor so basically phosphodiesterase inhibitor causes the degradation of cyclic amp which leads to bronchodilation so we are inhibiting here the the degradation of cyclic amp or the conversion of cyclic amp to amp by decreasing or inhibiting this phosphodiesterase enzyme 
So more cyclic AMP will lead to more bronchodilation. So all these drugs we will be discussing in the coming slide with details. So almost the same diagram, a bronchial tone, we have to a style quinine causes the Bianco constructions, leukotrienes, adenosines. So we have to stop this leukotrienes antagonist, uh, muscarinic antagonist, and we can use beta 2 agonist, which will cause a relaxation of the, of the uh, bronchioles. So the first class, beta 2 agonist, most important sympathomimetic used to reverse the uh, bron uh, asthmatic bronchoconstruction. So during asthma, these bronchioles are constricted. So these beta 2 agonists will cause the dilation of the bronchioles. These are almost given exclusively by the inhalation because you heard the drug or the route of choice for the asthma is inhalation. So it directly goes into the lungs and decreases um, it, so this inhalation decreases the systematic dose and also the adverse effect associated with systematic use uh, occasionally they are used by this nebulizer or uh, inhalers now we have different types of beta 2 agonists short acting and long acting so short acting are the drug of choice for acute asthmatic attack they will directly cause the a bronchodilation so they will be only used during that asthmatic attack and they will relieve this will relieve this asthmatic attack we have albitrol terbutaline salbutamol these are selective beta 2 agonist short acting selective beta 2 agonist while long acting they can be used for the prophylaxis uh, to inhibit the onset of asthmatic attack salmitrol and for metrols, these are selective beta 2 agonists, but they are long acting. Epinephrines and isoproteinols, these are non selective. Uh, they are occasionally used, not normally used, uh, but uh, most uh, commonly used drugs are these selective beta 2 agonists. And they can be used for the chronic obstructive pulmonary disease patients. Now mechanism of action of beta 2 agonist. So if you can see here, this is the beta 2 agonist and when it binds to its receptor, it causes the activation of adenyl cyclase. And adenyl cyclase causes the conversion of ATP to cyclic AMP. And now cyclic AMP uh, causes the activation of protein kinase A, which inhibit the actin myosin light, uh, myosin light chain and causes the bronchodilation. It can also opens the uh, calcium dependent uh, potassium channel. So opening of the potassium channel further lead to hyperpolarization of the, of the smooth muscles of the uh, bronchioles and leading to bronchodilation. So this is the mechanism through which this beta 2 agonist causes the bronchodilation. Adverse effects include the tremors, uh, tachycardia because it can some of the beta 2 can, uh, agonist can also cause the um, alpha 1, beta 1, uh, uh, beta 1 receptors and that can lead to tachycardia arrhythmias and tolerance or so tolerance is also one of the reasons that these drugs should not be used for long term they should be these drugs should be keep on changing so the second class in this bronchodilators is phosphodiesterase inhibitor uh, it inhibits the uh, phosphodiesterase enzyme and which in turn lead to increased concentration of cyclic AMP. So it is inhibiting the degradation of cyclic AMP by inhibiting the phosphodiesterase enzyme. And thus the further mechanism is same like it will in, uh, increases the uh, uh, protein kinase A which will inhibit the actin myosin light chains to contract and this will lead to dilation of the bronchioles. Uh, these methyl xanthines are found in plants and it can also provide stimulant effect 
can be present in uh, caffeines or theophylines. Uh, they have narrow therapeutic index um, and uh, therapeutic concentration ranges from 30 to 100 micromolar per liter. Um, and they are used to control nocturnal asthma. Nocturnal asthma is um, normally the, it's the symptom of asthma or the attacks of asthma are more during the night time when the patients are uh, lying down so the mucus can uh, accumulate in the, uh, in the bronchioles and it can increase or aggravate the asthmatic symptoms. So these can be used for controlling these nighttime asthmatic attacks. Adverse effects, GIT distress, tremor or insomnia because it's stimulant. So like caffeine that will lead to this insomnia. Overdose or toxicity, um, severe nausea and vomiting, hypotension. Uh, hypotension because it can also causes the uh, bronchial, it can also causes the vasodilation. So that will lead to hypotension, uh, cardiac arrhythmias and convulsion. So as a feedback, it can cause the cardiac arrhythmias and can precipitate the convulsion. The third class in this category are the muscarinic antagonists. So um, recall the autonomic pharmacology. Parasympathetic agonist will cause the constriction of the uh, bronchial. So we need parasympathetic antagonist or muscarinic antagonist in this, uh, this category. So we have to block the muscarinic receptors on the bronchioles. And we, these drugs, muscarinic, they competitively block the muscarinic receptor in the bronchial airways, thus preventing the bronchoconstructions. Uh, the drugs in this class are eprotropium and tortropium. These are used in asthma and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, but do not affect the N inflammatory aspect of asthma. So these drugs are basically bronchodilators. They are not affecting the inflammatory aspect of asthma. Do not cause tremor or arrhythmia. So this is the advantage of uh, this drug as opposed to beta 2 agonist. And now for long term management, we can use anti inflammatory drugs and steroids or glucocorticoids are the drug of choice for the anti inflammatory uh, process that is associated with asthma because it has broad anti inflammatory effect. Uh, it can be given, depends on the uh, condition intravenously, orally or inhalation. However, the route of um, the inhalation is more safer because to avoid the side effect associated with the steroids, uh, it's better to be given through inhalation. So the mode of action we have already discussed in the previous class that it is uh, inhibiting this phospholipase A2 enzyme and then inhibiting the formation of arachidonic acid. So it is blocking both the cyclooxygenase pathway and lipoxygenase pathway. That's why we cannot use this NSAID. If we use this NSAID, there are all, this will also have anti inflammatory action, but it will not inhibit the lipoxygenase pathway and it will lead to more production of leukotrienes which are causing the uh, vasoconstriction. So the better drug for uh, for this anti-inflammatory action in the uh, asthma are the steroids. So in addition to decreasing the inflammatory mediators, glucocorticoids also decrease the formation of cytokines that are responsible for the production of IGF. So that is also reducing the hypersensitivity, which is also one of the main reasons for asthmatic attack. So different glucocorticoids are available for the management of asthma, like beclamethasone, uh, dexamethasone are potentially beneficial in severe asthma. Uh, this is the mechanisms that the uh, steroid reduces the synthesis of arachidonic acid by inhibiting the phospholipase A2 enzyme. Administration depends on the condition. Uh, like oral glucocorticoids can be used chronically only if other therapies are failed. 
systemic intravenous glucocorticoid use in status asthmatic for short period of time so it's kind of emergency attachment or uh, asthmatic attack in this attack you can use only systemic intravenous glucocorticoids however the safe route is inhalation so inhaled glucocorticoids or aerosols is relatively safe which is considered as the first line therapy for moderate to severe asthma so they are this is the uh, safest route uh, for uh, for management of asthma it first effect depends on the route of administration and the severity so the nature and severity of side effect depends on the route of route uh, route of administrations dose and frequency of administration as well as the specific agent use so side effects are much more common with systemic administrations that it's very obvious uh, than with the inhaled or topical administrations the adverse effects of the systemic administration of the glucocorticoids include growth retardation cataract osteoporosis that we have discussed in the um, lecture of the uh, glucocorticoid CNS effects and increase stability to infection because it can decrease the immune system so the patient is more susceptible to infection increase blood pressure and increase blood glucose level because of the production of glucose it increase the gluconeogenesis Inhaled glucocorticoids are generally well tolerated. The most frequent side effects are local. So with inhalation, mostly you will have these local side effects because it will avoid the systemic dose. They include oral candidiasis, sore throat, uh, throat irritation or coughing. So it's morely local. Um, these are more commonly local side effects. Because of the uh, side effects produced by systemic administration of glucocorticoids, they should not be used for maintenance therapy unless all other treatment options have been exhausted. So this has to be uh, the last option uh, using this systemic glucocorticoids because of its side effects. We can use it uh, during asthmatic attack to elevate that um, that asthmatic attack but for maintenance therapy it's better to use other drugs or if steroids we can use it uh, through inhalation or uh, um, aerosol route uh, these mast cell stabilizers they are all they also have anti-inflammatory action they decrease the release of mediators like leukotriene cytokines and histamine from the mast cells Massive doses orally or by aerosol result in minimal side effects. So it can decrease, uh, it has these uh, selective action on only the release of leukotrienes, cytokines, or histamines. That's why they are much more safer and can be used in uh, children as well. So they, they, they decrease this. this um, As we have discussed that the uh, in the lipoxygenase pathway, the leukotrienes are the one which causes the bronchoconstriction. So we can use here um, the leukotrienes modulators. Either we can decrease the synthesis of leukotrienes, or we can uh, antagonize the, um, the the leukotrienes at the site of a receptor. So we have these leukotrienes modulators, leukotriene synthesis inhibitor. Zulotine, this is zulotine which inhibits is selective inhibitor of the 5 lipoxygenase, a key enzyme in the conversion of arachidonic acid to leukotriene. So they will inhibit the inhibition of leukotrienes. Uh, while leukotriene receptor antagonists, the zulfiglas and montiloclos, they are antagonist of the of the leukotriene. So they will inhibit the receptors on which this leukotrienes binds and causes this vasoconstriction. So they are orally active uh, zulfiglas and montiloclos are orally active leukotrienes. LD, uh, LTD4 receptor antagonists. The receptor, the adverse effects include elevation of the liver enzyme uh, that can occur with all these three agents and they can uh, um, decrease the bioavailability of other drugs. 
dyspepsia is the most common side effect of xylocos so it can have a side effect of dyspepsia but it is well tolerated this leukotriene receptor antagonists are well tolerated and do not have that uh, side effect of dyspepsia okay then the um, ige antibodies so we can use um, these antibodies ige antibodies because this ige antibodies is the main cause for the uh, inducing the inflammation or the inflammatory mediators omolizumab is humanized ige antibodies and reducing the ige reduce and that will reduce the asthmatic exacerbation so if the patient is allergic to this it will decrease the hypersensitivity reactions a severe asthma inadequately controlled by other agents it can be used uh, if uh, the other agents are um, not able to control the asthma uh, So for mucological management of asthma, we can use for the short term management, we can use a reliever drug and for long term management, we can use a controller drug. So relievers are used uh, on a need base for quick relief like rapid acting beta 2 agonists, systemic glucocorticoids for very short period of time and during uh, status asthmatic, uh, asthmaticus anticholinergic short acting methylxanthine short acting beta 2 receptor uh, agonist epinephrine or adrenaline so they can be, they can directly causing the bronchodilations or the uh, inflammation inhibition of inflammation in case of systemic glucocorticoids uh, long term management we can use inhaled glucocorticoids which are more safer uh, systemic glucocorticoids if other therapies fails then we can go for this systemic glucocorticoids mast cell stabilizers sustained release methyls and things sustained release methyls and things are those which are slowly and gradually degraded in the in the GIT or and uh, they have long half-life long acting oral or inhaled beta 2 agonist leukotriene modulators and monoclonal antibody or anti-IgE so these are used for the long-term management of uh, asthma so asthma can be controlled by for the first step you can avoid the allergens and these things in order to control the asthma without medication but if it is not controlled then start with the daily inhaled corticosteroid for mild uh, if still then you can use inhaled corticosteroid along with the long acting beta 2 agonist and if it's still not controlled then you can eat theophylines leukotrienes or oral anti corticosteroid so when the asthma is controlled then slowly and gradually taper down the drugs and uh, comes to minimal as uh, minimal drugs and minimal doses as possible severe asthma or status asthmatic uh, severe asthma is a medical emergency requiring hospitalization and the treatment uh, the patient should be given uh, oxygen inhaled salbutamols by nebulizers and uh, then intravenous hydrocortisone or glucocorticoids followed by the oral prednisolone so the therapy can be given intravenous glucocorticoids and then for maintenance they can be given um, oral until and unless this severe condition is vanished out antibiotics can be used because this uh, glucocorticoids can uh, reduce the immune system and the patient is more susceptible to infections and monitor the patient for any symptoms and treat the symptoms then aerosol drug therapy this is how this works because if you are uh, taking the drugs through aerosols most of it will go directly to the lungs and if some drug that uh, has been ingested most of this is uh, destroyed by the gastric ph so it will have minimal systemic side effects and more effect will be uh, local that is causing the dilation of the bronchioles 
so it depends on the you now the absorption depends on the particle size and for how long it stay within the uh, bronchial so that's why it is advised to inhale to uh, during uh, during this uh, inhalation take deep breath and uh, hold it for 10 seconds and then exhale in order to have maximum absorption here in the lungs so the critical management of the um, delivery of aerosolized drug uh, to the lungs depends on the particle size the smaller the particle size the more will be its absorption and the rate of breathing so breathe holding after inhalation it is recommended that slow and deep breath be taken and held for 5 to 10 seconds when administration when administering drugs to the lungs to conclude we should know the uh, different uh, options for the asthma and the their effects side effects and beneficial effects and whether we need it for short period of time or long period of time patient education is the key element of successful asthma management so we have to educate the patient regarding the use of medication avoid irritant and noxious substances which can trigger the, the, the hypersensitivity reactions modification of the patient lifestyle uh, stop smoking and avoid poison smoking so it can also lead to asthma and uh, avoid the allergens so that would lead to uh, decrease So this is the summary of the lectures that we have so far discussed introduction to asthma we have discussed a little bit about the pathophysiology of the asthma and then the drugs uh, the first class was the the, the bronchodilators we have beta 2 agonist and then uh, we discussed the selective beta 2 agonist short acting beta and long acting beta 2 agonist albuterol and salmitrol is the long acting non-selective or occasionally used then we have discussed phosphodiesterase inhibitors which increases the cyclic amp and muscarinic uh, agonist aprotropium and troprotropium in addition to that we have discussed the anti-inflammatory drugs like steroids and mast cell stabilizers so they in steroids inhibit the phospholipase a2 enzyme dexamethasone is uh, most uh, commonly used um, and then uh, we have discussed mass cell stabilizer chromolines leukotriene modulator either we can decrease the synthesis of leukotrienes or leukotrienes receptor antagonism and IgA antibody amolizumab which decreases the hypersensitivity reactions to allergens so that can be used for the for the long-term management or for the for the prophylaxis of asthmatic attack so that's all about the um, anti-inflammatory uh, this all about the uh, drug use for the management of asthma if you have any questions just write to me thank you